This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management, and this is Chapter 11, Applying the Capital Asset Pricing Model to Performance Measurement. Now we're going to build on what we did back in Chapter 10. Remember that Capital Asset Pricing Model formula included input variables such as the risk-free rate of interest, the expected return on the market portfolio, and the level of systematic risk, which we called beta. Those input variables are going to be critical in this chapter in which we're going to apply to some performance measures. So let's look at the learning objectives. We're going to examine the trainer and chart measures. We're going to look at Jensen's alpha. We're going to examine tracking error and information ratio and the Sortino ratio. And notice the learning objectives have the word calculate or compute in them. So we're going to have to get out our calculators and the side of our brain that can do math. What we're trying to do here is to evaluate the performance of a portfolio or an individual fund manager. Now, the easiest way to do that is probably just to look at the performance. We can look at a fund and say, hey, this fund generated 8% or 10% or 12%. And we could say, hey, that, that sounds okay. But of course, as good financial risk managers, as good financial analysts, you know that you can't evaluate performance just in a vacuum. You have to look around and see what is going on in the world beside us. And so, of course, we need to compare against the performance of something else. And something else, that something else has to be relevant and appropriate. And we call that, we generally call that something else the benchmark. And that benchmark could be an index. It, it could be a designated benchmark. It could be a created benchmark. And in many cases, it could just simply be the risk-free rate of interest. So let's start with this trainer measure. Let me read that first bullet point. It's a performance metric for determining how much excess return. All right, so we're comparing the performance of one portfolio against the performance of something else out there. We're calling that an excess return. You know, the old fashioned terminology was, can we beat the market? And so I guess that's what we're trying to do here. We are trying to evaluate underperformance or overperformance. What we're concerned about is not just the excess return, but we're concerned about how much it generated in terms of each unit of risk taken. So we'll define risk as volatility. Remember in that last chapter, I called risk the volatility or the variability in returns. Let's look at that trainer ratio equation. Notice what's in the numerator, the return on the portfolio under evaluation. What we're gonna do is subtract the risk-free rate of interest from that portfolio return. Think of this as the treasury bill yield. So in the numerator, we have an excess return. And we, we could call this, using the risk-free rate of interest as part of that numerator, we could call this an equity risk premium or the extra risk that this particular portfolio took on by investing in these risky securities in excess of that risk-free rate of interest. Because let's face it, by, when you buy a treasury bill or a treasury bond, you take no default risk. When you invest in a portfolio of risky securities, you take either you know, this much risk or, or this much risk. And then trainer divides by the level of systematic risk. So we're gonna divide by the beta of the portfolio under evaluation. And so note, this is a simple formula. You have a percent return in the numerator and you have a beta in the denominator. And remember what I said back in the previous chapter, that beta in general, in general, is between zero and two. Doesn't have to be, but in general. Now you guys know I like to give sports analogies, so let's go ahead and let me give you one here. Suppose we have two basketball players, A and B. One scores 30 points, one scores 25 points in a recent game, all right? So one way to evaluate the performance of player A and player B is just to say, oh, player B must be better because he or she scored 30 points and the other player only scored 25 points. And let, you know, after all, in kindergarten, you learn how to count. So everybody knows that 30 is greater than 25. But as a good 
financial risk manager, we need to look under the hood, so to speak. We need to figure out what else is going on. So let's suppose in, uh, in this recent game, player A's teammates scored 22, while player B's teammates scored 18. So there's just a little table summarizing that. So which one, which of these players? perform better in comparison to the contributions of their teammates. And so all we're going to do is take a division here. So if we divide 30 by 22 and 25 by 18, we get 1.36 and 1.39. So let's think about this. What does that mean is that even though player A scored more points, his performance was only 1.36 times better than his teammates performance whereas player B was 1.39 times better than his teammates, his or her teammates. So from this perspective, this is the trainer kind of analogy here. Player B performed better. Now, let's apply this to regular old financial markets. There's no doubt that we're going to evaluate portfolios or funds that have similar returns. But in many cases, those returns are not going to have similar vol levels of volatility. And so if A, if we're comparing two funds, A and B, if A is more volatile, volatile whereas B has been less volatile, then we need to make sure that we're comparing the relative performance of B to A. And even though, even though the relative performance might be equal in the numerator, that difference in volatility in the denominator is going to dictate which portfolio or which portfolio manager outperformed. So a higher trainer ratio indicates that the fund has performed well, not only in terms of the numerator, in terms of excess returns, but also in terms of the entire ratio, in terms of the entire ratio. So you've got to do top and bottom. Now, how about this William Sharp ratio? It's identical in the numerator. We're going to compute some kind of an excess return. But instead of dividing by systematic risk, we're going to divide by total risk. And remember, we said that total risk is uh, noted as the standard deviation of the portfolio. Now, let's go ahead and compare these two. So let me go back here. Notice that we're dividing by beta in the trainer ratio. So what we're automatically assuming here is that investors are holding well diversified portfolios when we use the trainer measure. OK, remember in that graph from chapter 10, the beta was the height from the horizontal axis to that bottom dotted line. Go back and look at that picture again if you need a refresher. But with standard deviation, remember that picture I had on the vertical axis, the average standard deviation of one stock is about 50%, but the average standard deviation of a well-diversified portfolio is about 15 or 16 or 17%. So here we're considering really, really large differences in the measure of risk. How do we interpret this sharp measure? Portfolio with the highest sharp ratio, just like trainer, has the best performance. Now, here's my here's the bullet point for the assumption that I was just talking about. The an implicit assumption of the sharp ratio is that the portfolio is not fully diversified, so that you need to use standard deviation as the measure of risk. Sharp measure is relevant for performance evaluation when comparing mutually exclusive portfolios. What are, what's this idea of mutual exclusivity? It means that the acceptance of one automatically means the rejection of another. So let's just think of an individual investor out there who has enough funds to uh, purchase one more portfolio, like some kind of a mutual fund. And if he or she is comparing two, they're going to pick one of those two. Well, the sharp measure is going to help out. Let's go ahead and compute the sharp ratio for a portfolio that has an expected return of 10, volatility of 8. An efficient portfolio has an expected return of 10 and a volatility of 10. Risk-free rate of interest is 
5%. So here's the sh sharp ratio. There's the 10% uh, minus the 5% risk re in the numerator. And there's standard deviation of 8% in the denominator. So we get about 63. The efficient portfolio, we've got 17 minus that same five, but we've got a 10% volatility, so standard deviation. So if we divide that, we get about uh, 120. So we're comparing 63 versus 120. And so therefore this efficient portfolio outperforms or is expected to outperform um, because it has the higher sharp ratio. Now notice that both Sharp and Trainer are examining these excess returns as compared to the risk-free rate of interest. But this guy, Michael Jensen, back in the 1960s said, you know what, let's, let's do this. Let's ask ourselves the question. At the beginning of the period, let's say the beginning of the year, we're going to invest in this particular portfolio on that day what do we reasonably expect to get out of that portfolio over the next year? One easy way to do this is say, suppose the portfolio cost 100 and we expect the portfolio to be worth 110 at the end of the year, including any reinvested dividends or interest. Well, that's an expected return of 10%. Then at the end of the year, let's go ahead and see exactly how much the portfolio actually earned. <clears throat> Maybe the portfolio is worth 115 at the end of the year, so that's a 15% actual return. And so what we can say then is that we thought we were getting 10 and we got 15, therefore we did better than what we thought we were going to do. And that's really kind of the context of the Jensen's Alpha. However, it's a little bit more formal because at the beginning of the year, we don't just sit back and say, oh, I think the portfolio is gonna be worth 110 at the end of the year, therefore I expect 10%. No, what Jensen does is he uses a well-defined and well-developed financial model called this capital asset pricing model. So CAPM gives us the expected return and we compare that to the actual return. And the difference is the extra return. Notice I have that there on the slide. We call that the Jensen's Alpha. And so what are we hoping with Jensen's Alpha? We're hoping to have a positive alpha, alpha which means we outperformed our expectations. So just quickly there, Jensen's Alpha is equal to R sub P, there's the actual return on the portfolio minus the expected return in the portfolio given to us by the capital asset pricing model, given to us by the Nobel Prize winning capital asset pricing model. What does a positive alpha mean? It's a signal of superior risk adjusted returns and that the manager is superior at either selecting stocks, remember we call that asset selection or predicting uh, the timing of the market by changing portfolio weights. We call that asset allocation. But remember now, we're using beta as a measure of risk. That's the measure of systematic risk. And so we're only considering this when the manager has the ability to diversify. And you can also use Jensen's Alpha to rank portfolios. Ah, let's go ahead and look at this uh, security market line that we did back in chapter 10. Notice on the horizontal axis, there's, uh, there's our betas. On the vertical axis, there's the portfolio return. The intercepting term there on the vertical axis is the risk-free rate of interest. Remember what I told you in that previous uh, chapter that the security market line is the equilibrium point of supply and demand for all stocks so that all stocks, according to the capital asset pricing model, under all of those restrictive assumptions like no taxes, right? Homogeneous expectations, all those assumptions that you learned in the previous chapter. Now, what we know is when the, the, those assumptions are relaxed because there are things like taxes and people do have different ideas and individuals are subject to behavioral biases so that every stock is not going to fall and every portfolio is not going to fall directly on that security market line. All right, so we've got 
we've got three portfolios here. Let, let's start with B, that's right in the middle. Notice that that star is located right on the security market line. This would be a portfolio that has zero alpha has a positive beta, but a zero alpha. And what that simply means is that the portfolio manager generated the exact return that was expected. And that's consistent with all the capital asset pricing model stuff that we've been talking about in this and the previous chapter. But let's go to portfolio A. If portfolio A with the highest of the three betas were to lie right on the security market line, it would be right next to portfolio B. But notice we see that it's a little bit above. So this is a positive alpha. This is one that uh, lies above the security market line in which we got more out of the portfolio than what we expected. And then portfolio C is just the opposite. That's where the level of systematic risk is a little bit less than the two other portfolios, but this has plotted below the security market line and therefore has a negative alpha. So we want to search for fund managers that can uh, mimic the behavior of portfolio A and not mimic the portfolio of behavior C. Should make perfect sense. Now, let me just do a comma here. This is not an exact replica of the security market line that we talked about in the previous chapter, but it gives us a sense of outperformance and underperformance. So here's a good summary table of the characteristics. And this is probably good to memorize for, uh, for any exam that you might be taking. Boy, we've talked about this. So Sharp uses total risk. Trainer and Jensen use systematic risk. They use beta. Sharp source is portfolio theory. And Trainer and Jensen, they both rely on the capital asset pricing model. And then there are various uses for each of these types of ratios. But remember this that um, Trainer and Jensen are used for well diversified portfolios, Sharp can be used for all portfolios. Here we go. Sharp ratio appropriate for the evaluation of an entire portfolio. Now remember, remember that uh, what I said in that previous video was that if investors take unsystematic risk, they're not really compensated for it. And that's according to this whole well diversified portfolio and the capital asset pricing model. But this is what we do know. We do know that prices move away from their fundamental values for a variety of reasons. So Sharp is pretty applicable um, because sector funds and individual portfolio managers are trying to chase that positive alpha. Now, Trainer and Jensen are fairly useful uh, for an evaluation of multiple portfolios to include in an existing portfolio. And so here's the standard kind of an example. Suppose that uh, you're a financial analyst and you have a client that comes to you that has a variety of mutual funds and wants to add another one to the portfolio. And so uh, going by the assumption that those a client has a well diversified portfolio, it's probably more appropriate to use a uh, trainer and Jensen. All right, let's move on to that second learning objective and talk, start talking about tracking error. Uh, tracking error sounds like something went wrong, but that's really not what this, how this term should be applied. Tracking error is the divergence between the behavior of a position and the behavior of a benchmark. And it is a standard deviation. So tracking error is a measure of risk. It's not really an error in terms of the fund manager made mistakes. It's a measure of how far the manager has deviated from the benchmark. Now that should make perfect sense here. Notice tracking error is the standard deviation of the difference between the returns on the particular portfolio and the returns on the benchmark. And so think about this. If the benchmark is doing this, right? If the benchmark is doing that and our portfolio is doing that, 
Suppose that's right on top of it. Tracking error is going to be zero. So the tracking error, the two funds, they perform, you know, kind of equally. Think of this. If you're the fund manager and your fund is called the, uh, the Jim's S&P 500 index, what's going to happen here? You're going to mimic the performance of the S&P 500 index, so tracking error is going to be pretty low. Right. But if the benchmark goes like this and your portfolio goes like this, there's going to be a huge tracking error. All right. So low tracking error indicates the performance is close to the performance of the benchmark. High tracking errors means that it's significantly different. So don't think of tracking error as an error. Just think of it as a difference. But it's a standard deviation. So everything that we've talked about so far in terms of risk management principles, this is a standard deviation. Now here's a good picture that gives you kind of an example of what tracking error means. So notice on the horizontal axis, I have time, and then I have some measure of the cumulative return over time. So we start at zero, and so the portfolio goes up a little bit, then it goes down a little bit, and then it goes up a bit, and then it trends upward to uh, one year from today. So let's look, uh, let's look out at that one year from today. There's our cumulative return in the middle. And at the risk of giving you vertigo, go ahead and turn your head sideways. There's a normal distribution that you can see that is centered on that return. Now, what a tracking error of 4% means is that we can go, we can go one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. And we can do all of that stuff that we talked about uh, and applying standard deviation in terms of normal distributions. And so a tracking error of 4% gives you kind of an expected range of what those cumulative performance is going to be over some time period. All right, go ahead and tilt your head back up and blink your eyes a few seconds. Hopefully you're not dizzy. All right, how about the information ratio? I mean, this is really uh, kind of an additional piece of information that's going to add value to our understanding of risk management. Remember in those first chapters, we talked about identifying the risks and, and quantifying the risk. And it's your job as the financial risk manager. I gave the analogy of the quarterback coming over to the sideline and visiting with the coach. Well, the information ratio, if excuse the pun, is going to include a little bit more information. So as the quarterback, you come over to the sideline and you tell the coach about the sharp ratio and you tell the coach about the capital asset pricing model and Jensen's alpha. And the coach says something about, well, what about the defense if it does this and this and this? And the quarterback says, oh, wait a minute, we can talk about the tracking error of this. And so as uh, you're as the financial risk manager, you're reporting to the coach who's the chief risk officer. And then that chief risk officer can process all of this extra information and then send you back out fully prepared to handle whatever the defense is going to throw at you. So notice the formula, the equation for the information ratio is similar to what we've been doing. There's a portfolio return in the numerator. We're going to subtract out the benchmark return. But then instead of dividing by a measure of total risk or a measure of systematic risk, we're going to divide by the tracking error. So this information ratio gives us some idea of the manager's ability to use information, right? and the skill set to generate an excess return. And we're still trying to pursue that outperformance. We're still trying to pursue alpha. So we're going to combine this stuff. Let me just go back here. What did I do there? There's that formula for the tracking error. It's a standard deviation. And we can do all of this stuff here, assuming a normal distribution, and then we can make a better decision. Now, the Sortino ratio was developed by this guy, Frank Sortino, in the early 1980s. And uh, again, Sortino, as the quarterback, was coming over to the sideline and telling the quarterback, I'm sorry, telling the coach about all this different stuff. And then the quarterback says something like, hey, you know what? When things go really, really poorly for the defense, they try to do this. Oh my gosh. So instead of dividing by 
standard deviation or beta or the uh, tracking error, let's go ahead and divide by something different. Let's call this the semi-standard deviation. Semi meaning part. Now remember, standard deviation measures stuff that goes on this way and stuff that goes on this way. But the semi-standard deviation measures only the variability of returns to the left. And let's be more specific, that fall below the minimum acceptable rate of return. So we're trying to isolate kind of the standard deviation that we're more worried about, right? We're more worried when prices fall than when prices rise, assuming we have the long position. So look at the Sortino ratio. It's going to be a numerator, just like we always have had. So it's the return on the portfolio. But instead of subtracting a risk-free rate or some other kind of rate, we're going to subtract the minimum acceptable rate of return. And then we're going to divide by that uh, semi-standard deviation. Now, Sortino is useful for investors and analysts and portfolio managers to evaluate the investment or the fund's return for a given level of bad risk. And that's really, you know, kind of a general term, bad risk. What we're talking about is the negative deviation of the portfolio returns. But remember how we talked about this gigantic spreadsheet? And on this spreadsheet, right in the middle, we have this expected return. Suppose it's 10%. And then on the right, we have returns like 15 and 20%, but on the left of it, we have returns like five and zero. And how about a minus five? And how about a minus 10, right? So what we're interested in is the variability to the left, which includes something that's less than zero. So think about what this adds. It adds value so that we can understand how the total variability, right? on either side, but also the negative variability impacts the decision. So think about this, you as the quarterback running over to the sidelines and you whip out your iPad and you have your Excel spreadsheet and you tell your coach about standard deviation and beta and tracking error and semi-standard deviation and all this kind of stuff. And the coach looks at you and says, boy, I know why you're my quarterback because you're giving me all of this great information. So the chief risk officer is looking at you as the financial risk manager and saying, hey, I think I may give you a raise next time around. I think that summarizes our, uh, our chapter 11. We did Trainer and Sharp and Jensen, and we did, the, we did the tracking error, the information ratio, and Sortino. What we're going to do next, then, is we're going to take this capital asset pricing model, which kind of uses just maybe one factor, and we're going to add some extra factors out there. And this is going to continue to add to our understanding of risk management.